Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for a community of professionals that are looking to share, learn, and grow where you can talk openly and freely about the highs and lows in your business? If so, I want to invite you to check out my inner circle at AngelaProfit.com slash membership. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Profit. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Weddings Unveiled. And today I'm so excited to introduce to you guys Claire White of White Ink Calligraphy. Thank you so much for joining us, Claire. Thanks for having me, Angela. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. So for all of our listeners who don't know, so Claire and I were at an industry event. Well, I would say like a women it in this. Like it was like an outer industry event. Like it wasn't really industry. Yeah, that's true. I guess it was more like women entrepreneurs. Yeah. And it was all around the Beyonce <laughs> Lemonade <laughs> album, which I'm going to confess peeps. Like I've never heard it in my life until Stop it. the night before <laughs> of like, shit, I better like listen to if I need to talk about this. And I actually turned on the videos while like the whole album while I was working and like a lot of it caught my attention. I was like, dang, she's like really angry, <laughs> you know, but I don't really follow pop culture that much. And so I only know what I hear. I don't know what to believe and I really don't care, but it was so fun. I mean, I had a great time. Did you have fun? Like, oh, was- I did. It was a great panel of speakers. Yeah. And, you know, it was in my neighborhood. I live in, on the East side. And so I went with a girlfriend of mine and we had drinks and bites and listen to everyone talk about the lemonade album. It was a total random night for me. Really? Like I saw the event on Facebook and I'm like, sure, why not? Really? And like I'm so up? happy that you were there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, so had you listened to the whole album? Yeah, but I was definitely like a late listener. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, it, when it came out, maybe I heard like a song or two, but it wasn't until recently that I sat down and listened to it you know, top to bottom with the visual. Yeah. So it's, it's really crazy, but like, I just don't, I don't know. Like I grew up in a household where they're like, you don't judge. There's always two sides to every story. You respect people no matter what. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. like my friends were like, what did you think of it? Cause they saw the event on social media. I'm like, I don't really have I I mean, I was kind of speechless. I was just like, I'm not judging anything. Like it was a very well done album and the videos were very well put together and pretty thought out. So anyway. (laughs) Well, I think that what Beyonce did with the album, telling this massively long story of her current life and her hustle and her marriage and her child it relates back to entrepreneurship just as a whole and how important it is to be personal and to put your story out there totally and to be honest and vulnerable and no one's perfect we all make mistakes we all do stupid stuff sometimes well I don't say stupid I say well this is an opportunity to grow (laughs) like I'm not gonna do that again (laughs) Like I'm trying to be positive about it. But anyway, tell us about you and tell me about your background. Yeah. So I am a Nashville native, born and raised here in Nashville. I'm one of the few. I'm an attorney. I work for child support services here in Davidson County. And I got into calligraphy about three or four years ago. And Ever since then, I, I mean, do you want the long story? Or yeah, like tell, jump in, tell us. I mean, so 
it's kind of sad, Angela, it's but okay. it's not sad. It's through many therapy sessions. I can definitely, it's not sad to me anymore, but I feel like when I tell it, you know, it kind of puts a damper, but it's okay. I'm happy to share. Um, We're all about being real here. <laughs> so I graduated from law school. I got engaged. And I wanted to hand letter my own invitation. So I took a class, we had a wedding, I, you know, gorgeous wedding. And then two years later, my ex-husband decided he no longer wanted to be married. Well, I got one of those two girlfriends. So welcome to real life. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so my world was like crushed what? at the time. It was awful. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. And but you're you know, stronger divorce, now, right? What's that? You're stronger now, right? Oh my gosh, so much stronger. And this, you know, we're getting to that, Angela. Ah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, at the time, the world had ended, and the worst part of it was that I was actually cohabitating with him um. during the divorce. And so I would lock myself in my office for hours, and I found therapy in my calligraphy. Uh -huh. There you go. Right. And so one day my sister comes over and she's like, you know, she's the little digital and tech guru. And she's like, you need to make a logo and just put yourself up there on social media and see what happens. Yep. So she did the logo for me. She kind of pushed me to do it. She's my biggest cheerleader. You know, when you're going through a hard time in your life, you fall off of social media. You don't want the world to know what you're going through. Right. And retroactively looking on it now, I found so much comfort in like showing to my friends and my family, like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I'm still alive. I'm doing something. And here's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So that was 2017 that that happened. And then I started practicing calligraphy under my brand name, White Ink Calligraphy. And White is my maiden name. So I went back to White and that's where that came from, White Ink Calligraphy. Okay. Yeah. So then I also found an amazing group of girlfriends in the wedding industry. Mm -hmm. New, a new group to hang out with and to go to these networking events because we all love networking. And I just kind of jumped into it head first and was like, sink or swim, let's do it. <laughs> and, and it has been the funnest thing ever. And I've just, I've been having an amazing time. I'm in my second year under this brand and it's still my side hustle because I work full time, Yeah, but it, it's a second job. It's, I work two full-time jobs essentially. Yep. We've all been there. I've been there, done that. Yep. Yeah. So that's kind of where, you know, my background, that's where it all started. So Going back, like, how did you decide that you wanted A, to be an attorney and B, how did you land in child services specifically for that? Do you love kids? <laughs> I'm just wondering. No. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. I should not I don't. say that. I don't have kids. <laughs> um, I love my nephew. Mm -hmm. But so I've always, and I was thinking about this when I was like getting ready for this podcast, Angela, I've always kind of had this hustler drive. When I was in high school, I was a runner for a law firm. Oh, wow. After school and on my summer breaks. And then I worked for that law firm full time when I was an undergrad. And then when I was in law school, I worked full time for another law firm. So I've always had this like double life, mm -hmm. like two things going at once. And it's kind of been my norm. And it, you know, it's very fulfilling to me to set goals and reach goals and surpass goals or fail or whatever, ha you know, whatever happens, I've just always kind of have this like busy hustler mindset. Yeah. I feel like that's what entrepreneur is being one is all about it. But when I was younger, my, I mean, my parents weren't entrepreneurs, so I didn't really, I didn't even know what that word was. I definitely didn't know how to spell it. I, I still don't think I really know how to spell it. That's okay. <laughs> Thank God for Siri and Spelljack. But yeah, it's just those of us who I feel like but if we fast forward 10 years, like the younger kids coming out, everyone's like, oh, entrepreneurism. But it wasn't like that when I was in school. And so I kind of lived it. I totally feel you. I lived like a triple life. I was like in healthcare and then I taught at the gym. And then I had like this wedding thing for fun. And I never thought about making it a business. That was never the intention whatsoever. It just kind of happened. And it is crazy, but like crazy in a good way. It's like a good God thing where 
we find such amazing journeys, like going down a positive path where we see it as being so negative. And then really, it's kind of like the best thing ever. And it's like, you know, the next big thing. I was married when I was super young. Half the people don't even know that because I don't even talk about it because it, I feel like it never even happened. <laughs> like I was so young and it was so long ago. And I mean, my uncle was a wedding planner my, and he owned a venue. And so everything was done kind of for me. I, I didn't care. I just kind of showed up. But it was more like my parents thing because I was the oldest kid and then the war started and he got deployed and I didn't even know what that meant. And then it's like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> so right. for me, it wasn't like my world stopped because while he was gone, I'm like, God, I didn't sign up for this. Like I grew up with a mom and a dad and I built a business while he was gone because there was nothing else to do except work and pay my student loans off. Right. <laughs> You know, but then looking back and when I started my wedding business, you know, everyone assumes everybody in the wedding industry industry is just like happily married and we like are just live these perfect marriage lives. And I'm like, wait, no, like, why would you assume? That? Right. I'm like, yeah, no, I found a huge, like, that was my biggest worry jumping yeah. into the wedding industry after being divorced. I'm like, is it a big secret that like I shouldn't share or, you know, will people like you're working with brides at their like happiest moment of their life. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through my divorce and working with brides, my sweet girlfriends, they would call me and be like, are you okay to do that? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I'm okay. You know, it kind of, it was like showing me that happiness did exist and everything would be okay. It was very refreshing, but at the same time, I think there were people who were, or close friends of mine who were just like, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I feel like when you end up finding your place, um, like I never, I've, I've had friends say, well, aren't you jealous and don't you want that? And I'm like, listen, marriage is hard. It's a job. You have to compromise a lot. You have to, there's a lot of things to make a marriage work. And being a planner and being there every step of the way with your couples, you see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so really it, it tells a lot with couples, how they communicate and how they treat each other and if they respect each other or not. And it, it becomes a balance. And the older I get, the noiser, the noise, is that even a word? Like the world becomes more noisy <laughs> and distractions. And it's like, yeah. you know, I, I People think that they, even myself, like at a very young age, because that's all my parents. I mean, my parents were married until, you know, death do them part, like for real. But I look back and I'm like, God, they went through so much. And like now people just give up because it's easy to give up and you don't have to work hard for it anymore. And it's, it's socially accepted. And it's like, Hey, if you're not happy, like you should be happy. Like you don't need another person to complete you. And you know, the whole Jeremy, Jerry Maguire thing, like you complete me. And I'm like, that shit don't exist. Like, come on, like, let's just be honest. Like marriage is hard. Like, yes, there's happy times, but there's also hard times. And it really like love and friendship really can withstand it or they can't. And that's when people kind of like turn away because they don't respect each other. At least that's what I see. Like, I feel like some days I'm just people's therapist. And then when people oh, are bet. like, will you ever get married? I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's, never say never. I know, I know, but it's just, um, it's almost like a catch 22, like working in the wedding industry. And then it's like, I don't, do people ask you being in the wedding industry? Like if you get married again, like, would you have this big wedding or would you just like go away to a destination? Like, do you know what you would do? I don't. You don't. See, I, I, don't. I, I mean, people ask a lot and like the easy answer is I would just elope. Yeah. You know, me too. but <laughs> me too. you know, you have to think of the other person, I guess. That's true. <laughs> That's what true. they would want. Compromise. But, compromise. Yeah. It's all about, but it is, it, it, that's why I love true colors. Have you done true colors yet? 
the personality no, test. But I heard you talking about it on another podcast. Yes. I'm like psycho. <laughs> they don't, they don't pay me to say this, but like it really <laughs> truly does like opposite detract for your first marriage. And then a lot of the clients that I do that are like their second and their third marriage, they they're all, they're the same because they don't want to work as hard as they had to on the first one to respect the other person's wants and needs. And it's just, it's fascinating to me with all those different personality tests. Like, I feel like that's why one of the reasons a lot of my couples, they meet online now, they get on these websites and, but there's a whole methodology of psychology behind that, where they're pairing people that would be a good match for each other's needs. So there's, I mean, there's some, you know, good truth to it, but Anyway, so we know how you got into the wedding industry. Yeah. And that's what sisters are for, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was an interesting road and now like I couldn't imagine my life any different. Right? I just so you were you were saying earlier that you know, being an attorney, I feel like which you haven't done true colors, but in attorney land, you have to be very gold and green, which means there has to be a process and a procedure and there's law laws <laughs> and, you know, you have to do your research. And is that how you have to be like in your day job? Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I'm in court twice a week. I have assistants that help me and I, what I do is very high volume. Okay. So it's very repetitive. Um, but essentially, you know, assisting families in setting child support and I strictly work with unmarried parties. So that makes it interesting. And, um, when the non-custodial parent doesn't pay their child support, I'm the one who argues to put them in jail oh. when there's, yeah, so it's very, and you know, generally speaking, that's a, a father yeah. who's not paying for support, and it's always interesting because not only in the courtroom do, do I get quite a few attorneys who do not think that I'm an attorney, right? who think I'm an assistant of some sort, but it's also the non-custodial father, the parent who hasn't been paying support. They think I'm like a social worker <laughs> or, and I'm like, no, you're going to jail today. Like right. I'm the last, you know, the last one. And it's, um, it's very empowering because I worked very, very hard for my law degree and yeah. I love assisting, um, you know, parents who need the help. Yeah. It's when I worked in mental health, when I first started out in healthcare, it was the saddest thing ever because the, it was like the third floor, the unit was adolescence. And mm -hmm. I felt like 50, maybe even 60 or 75 of the kid percent of the kids that were there, they did not have a mental illness. They were just in the state's custody because they didn't have a, a mom or a dad or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or anybody take care of them. And so they just ended up in our facility because they were being cared for by the state and then putting them in the same environment with children with legit mental illnesses made those kids a little bit crazy too. It was just the saddest thing. And some of the visitations that I would sit in on, I'll never forget literally a five-year-old, a mom came in to see him and he sat down. This is one of the reasons I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this for the rest of my life because of this five-year-old. But they sit down, the mom sits down and I mean, I, I, my dad was an undercover drug agent. So I grew up around drugs in that capacity. Like we would go to night court, <laughs> like my dad yeah. was in court, you know? And so, um, you know, so I knew some of those things that other therapists didn't know, but they're like, wait, how do you know she's on meth? I'm like, she has holes in her arms. Look at her teeth. Like, look at, you can just, you can tell. And they're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, let's just move on. But literally the five-year-old said, mommy, I'm sorry. I haven't been home to feed you. And like a um, five-year-old saying that to the mom. And so basically that was their last meeting before we went to court. And, you know, the attorney basically took the child away from the mom, period. And there was no doubt in the picture. 
And so the mom left and then the little kid looks at the, the doctor, the psychiatrist that I was practicing under. And he said, if you take me away from my mommy, I will kill you like a five-year-old. And like, yeah. he looks like a little demon. And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm never doing this. <laughs> like, this is awful. So like, do you have to deal with the kids at all? I'm so no. going off on a tangent, but <laughs> no, I don't. The only time I see the children are when like the parent who is not paying the support and they don't want to go to jail, they'll bring the children to court Aww. so that, you know, there's kind of sympathy. Like if you take me to jail, then what about the kid? Um, but it's really hard because I'll have to remind parents when they're arguing, you know, the, the big thing is I deal with people's children and money. And those are the two most volatile things yeah. that you can like argue about with a stranger. Yeah. And I have to constantly remind parties, like we are here for the child to make sure this child is cared for. Like, I don't, it's, it's irrelevant if you are, you know, only working part time, you need to get a second job. Like, so it's very, um, social worky in that aspect, but yeah, also, um, you know, I don't, I don't see the kids. I'm not removing the kids from the homes. I'm not arguing in that respect. I'm just making sure that the kids are supported. But then after that, you get to go home and be with your puppy and (laughs) do like really beautiful, creative things that crossover. Cause a lot of times, like a lot of the attorney, like I have a lot of clients that are doctors, attorneys, and accountants and like the two don't often cross over. I feel like it's like, you're either like super smart and like on your game with research and and like, there's no creative bone in in their body. But then, so you were saying earlier how there's a nice balance between the two. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, um, I mean, a balance between the intellectual side and the creative side, as well as a balance with the clientele. Um, and the type of work I'm doing when I'm, when I'm at my day job, I'm, like you said, it's very repetitive. It's a big wheel. I'm pushing cases in and out, in and out throughout the whole day. And when I get home and, you know, settle in with my dog and get a glass of wine, I sit down, I answer emails to like, some of the happiest people in the world, these brides that are just so excited to get started on the calligraphy and all the details of their wedding. And, you know, as you know, Angela, half, half the job is answering emails, but then other than that, I'm (laughs) sitting, you know, at my desk or on my coffee table, binge watching something on Netflix and, (laughs) um, knocking out the calligraphy and, you know, being as creative as I want to be like the clients that are like, do whatever you think looks best. Like those are the dream clients. Right. right? I can have fun with it. Yeah. So those are orange people, just so you know, (laughs) in true colors. And, um, I don't know, like I try not to do it is it's, there's so much email, but I have really tried hard to like put literally everything on my blog. So if people have a question, I'm like, go search the blog. There's an answer there. And if there's not, we'll go do a blog about it. And then we started using um, Marco Polo, which is an app. And it's a free like video walkie talkie app. And then Bomb Bomb to do videos. And we'll like hold things up and like show people and be like, do you like one? Or do you like two? Or do you like three? And people it's just it just goes faster and so by setting like this new expectation of like stop emailing me (laughs) like with emotional money spending it's just really difficult because people will take things the wrong way I mean probably in like handwriting and things like that it's maybe a little bit more straightforward where it's like do you like this or do you like this um but like what kind of do people just have a ton of questions for you Uh, Well, on the front end, I have a general questionnaire that I ask them, you know, all the information that I need, like, you know, who's your stationer, like all the basic questions that I need to get started and provide them a quote. And so 
I use this fabulous program called Dubsado. Ooh, what's uh, that? It's a CRM program that I discovered like I discovered it. It's been around for a while, but um, I started it at the beginning of 2018 and it has changed my life. So I can get an, an inquiry, like a lead capture for my website, and then it auto sends them based upon their email. My program will auto send them a questionnaire so that I can get all the answers to what I need before I get started. That's awesome. And yeah. And then like, you know, they complete that questionnaire and then it's an auto reply, like I'll be in touch, you know? So they know like something's happening. It's not just like an email that's just waiting to get answered. Um, so that's been a game changer for me. And, you know, I get a lot of questions regarding style okay, and, um, specifics on like, you know, I find that a lot of people, the, the lay person to calligraphy doesn't really know what they want sometimes. Yeah. They're just like, I see your social media and I like what you do, do what you do. Or, you know, they they'll send me a specific post from another calligrapher, something they saw on Pinterest, the rabbit hole of Pinterest. Oh Lord. And I have to explain to them, you know, calligraphy is something that's done by hand. It is an art. Every calligrapher's hand is different. I can do something similar, but it's not going to be the same. If you want the same, you need to contact that. Exactly. So, you know, once you kind of gauge like, you know, what they want or what they're looking for, then we move forward. But I also find that a lot of my clients, you know, they find me on social media or it's a referral or they just go straight to my website and they're like, you're the person, let's do it. That's awesome. Like, what would you say, which kind of like leads me in, it's a perfect segue, like, be, what would you say is your style? Like what's special, unique about like your ser- service? Like, so for example, th- this is like my typical client. So, you know, we try to get them to pick a font or two or three, and then it's like the ink color. And then do you want it thin, medium or thick? Or like, how deep do you go in with these people about beautiful handwriting. (laughs) Yeah, that's a great question. So I, um, I work with a lot of different stationers around town and quite a few of my referrals come from the stationers. So if they are getting, like if the client wants spot calligraphy from the start, like they want my calligraphy on the actual invitation suite, then we go through all the details of like what kind of font you want. What do you want it to look like? What is it, you know, thin or thick or what color ink? How much flourishing? But then most of my clients already have a digital font. So they're, they have like a printed calligraphy font that came from a digitized computer. Does that make sense? Yes. So do you, so so for our listeners who don't really understand what that is, because like until I'm like sitting down at Dear Addie one day and she's like, oh, we can blah, 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 blah. I'm like, wait, what? what? I love Allison. Yeah, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> so yeah. what, so tell her like, what exactly does that mean? And then how do you translate that? Yeah. So if you sit down with a stationer and they design an invitation suite for you from their fonts and you have say a mix of block lettering and a script font in your invitation. Um, They would then send me the invitation suite and I would best complement my style of calligraphy to match the script font that's being used on the invitation suite. Does that make sense? Yes. And so again, (laughs) like, for people, so a full, explain to us, like, what is a full invitation suite? And here's, like, I, we literally, like, I'm so anal OCD, and so is Allison, and that's why I love working with them. I mean, but we, we honestly work with people, like, you know, she's obviously local to Nashville, but we've got people that we work with in New York, and LA, and Minnesota. Yeah. I mean, there's so many amazing creative people out there. However, they don't always have the process like down to a T. So I've like made my own template and 
like literally people are so overwhelmed by it's like, we'll start with like save the dates and then we'll move to talking about the invite. And then they're like, well, do you want calligraphy on the inner envelope and the outer envelope and the oh, RSVP yes. envelope? Yes. And so to, and the return address. Exactly. <laughs> so walk us through yeah. what you typically do and like, what are all those, what do those options look like? Yeah, so the number one requests that I get are for the outer envelopes, uh, full addressing for the front of the outer envelope. And then a lot of times my clients will um, get the back, the return address printed on the back from their stationer, or they will have me hand letter the back return address. Um, and I can also, you know, send a digital file of my calligraphy to the stationer or whoever it is that they're working with, if they're working with like an Allison at Dear Abby or whoever, um, so that they can use my calligraphy to print on the back of the envelopes, which is a way to save money. Um, so you have the outer envelope, you have the inner envelope, which a lot of, you know, non-traditional brides are skipping out on these days, which is fine. Um, and then you have, the option for spot calligraphy, and that's becoming more and more popular so that the scripted font that's on the actual invitation or like the details card or, you know, some kind of insert that goes in with the invitation matches the calligrapher's hand that's being done on the outer envelope. That is so cool. <laughs> So cool. And so, yeah, and I love it because it gives me the opportunity as, you know, a calligrapher to work with these stationers who some I've never worked with, some out of state, most of them local. And instead of them pulling up a font that's overused or, you know, all over Pinterest, they're like, what's, you know, an extra $50 to have your name hand lettered and the groom's name hand lettered? to put on the invitation so that it will all match. Right. It's so beautiful. I mean, we've had a few people that are traditional enough to where they want their whole, like everything hand done. Like, if, oh yeah. You print I love it. Done that? I love it. And like letter pressed and, you know, I love every piece of that. And that's, I'm getting more and more requests um, for that because I've, you know, I've been in the calligraphy industry for long enough that I've kind of developed my own style. Which is awesome. And, yeah. And it's something that's so nerdy and like I'll geek out with other calligraphers, you know, about it. But I want my own style to be so that like you could look at my Instagram or, you know, some random photo and be like, that is Claire. Yeah. So. Do you think you'll ever teach classes or? Oh my gosh, Angela. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I just taught a class and I'll tell you, I made a, a scheduling mistake. I had my first class on August 18. Oh, so that was like really soon. Like basically yesterday, but it was <laughs> two weeks. Eight, 18, 18. Okay. And, and I had five weddings that weekend that, cause wow. I do a lot of event signage for the weddings and like seating charts and stuff. Yeah. I think you've done some stuff for us. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I had this, you know, this great idea to do this class and do it the way I want to do it and not have any co-hosting and no sponsorships and, you know, charge what I, I needed to teach the class, how I wanted it to be done which was very empowering and so fun to do. And then what I realized I scheduled it on like the biggest, I think the not.com said it was like the biggest wedding day of the year. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. And so I ha had to hire people to help me with some deliveries and it all worked out in the end. And it was by far the best weekend I've had in an, a very long time. But the oh. class was you know, the class sold out in 24 hours. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and I had to open up a second class, which I was like, I won't need to do that. You know, I won't have that many people interested. And so I, I taught two classes back to back. 
and I am going to be teaching it again in the spring. So I'm hoping to keep it kind of like a semi-annual thing. That is awesome. Is it like a day long workshop? Like what do you do? So it was about two and a half hours and um, I had it at meet and greet in Nashville, which is this like super cute venue in Hillsborough Village. And it's a small, intimate class of 16 people so that you get enough like one-on-one time with me. And I start from the basics, calligraphy 101 on like how to care for the tools, how to use the tools, how to clean the tools. And, you know, watching everyone put the pen to paper for the first time, it's like everyone gets so nervous and, you know, and then it's fun and we have champagne and donuts and it's just like a girl's afternoon that is awesome yeah that's so cool and then do you do you have them like submit their work for a contest or anything to see oh no No. I, I feel like that I don't know it's surprising how intimidated people get really Yeah. I mean, they come in because calligraphy is not easy. Right. And I feel like people, you know, they want it to be easy or they think it's going to be easier than it is. Yeah. So a lot of the class is just kind of like teaching the, the craft and the awareness of like, this isn't easy. It takes a lot of practice, but I'm going to give you the tools And I'm going to teach you how to get started. And then you're going to go home and practice. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. So I had in this last class that I did in August, I had quite a few brides in there. I had quite a few clients, like previous clients and mothers of the brides. And it was just, it was so, so fun. And everyone, they're like, oh my gosh, this is not what I expected. Oh, you know, that's awesome. harder than they would think, but it's, it's so rewarding to teach. So isn't it though? Like I, I just, I love it. Like I love helping and teaching and it brings satisfaction, you know, when someone actually wants to learn how to do something, um, is just, is awesome. Like, so have you loved all your clients or some of them you're like, Oh, this maybe isn't a good fit. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Um, I've, you know, it's (laughs) It's a hard question. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've had the majority, like 99.99% of my clients have all been absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. And they, and it's so sweet, Angela, because they, you know, they want to continue to be a part of the growth of your business and a part of your life after their big day. Mm -hmm. And so I've been, um, you know, under white ink calligraphy, I'm like always looking for ways to continue to serve my clients. And the big thing that I found that everyone loves is, you know, the first wedding anniversary is paper. Yes. So everyone wants their vows hand lettered. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And then to like hang it in your home and have a story and say, yeah, the calligrapher that did my invitations, she did this. And, you know, I really strive to put myself in a position where I'm like, I am your family calligrapher. Like I'm not just your wedding calligrapher. I want to be there for every special event. And anytime that you need anything, please reach out, you know, like the family photographer, like the people who always take the photos. Like I I want to continue that relationship with my clients. That's so do you tell them that? I mean, oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, in my Insta stories, I'm, I'm, I'm big on social media. So my social game, I guess, you know, I'm constantly posting updates. And right now you should see my house. I have... <laughs> Florida ceilings. Okay. So right now it's what? September 5th that we're recording. Yeah. And I have floor to ceiling and half of my living room boxes full of faux pumpkins. Oh, do you love the fall? I love the fall, but I mean, I'm lettering on these pumpkins for clients. Oh, gotcha. Um, Yeah. No, I don't just like love to have pumpkins in my house, (laughs) but (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, so they're everywhere, and everyone's like, it's kind of like, hey, it's pumpkin season, and they're like, Claire, I need my pumpkin. <laughs> so what I'm doing this year. <laughs> That's funny. I know. It's re- I mean, my bless my dog's heart. He like walks around him and he's just like skittish because they're not heavy boxes. And he's always like, are they going to fall? But I think this year I'm going to, um, I've been doing pre-orders on my pumpkins and then I'm just going to have a day and like the end of September, early October, tell all my clients to come pick them up and yeah. have a little pumpkin party and see everyone. And that's awesome. Yeah. It's funny because I think yesterday, the day before, somebody said, um, what did they call it? P S P S L. They're like, oh my God, it's like P S L (laughs) week. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? (laughs) Like, I had no. Oh, yeah. And she said, the pumpkin spice latte. And I'm like, oh, I don't really drink that. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, you like don't live in like real world society. She's like, I'm going to send you some YouTube things and you've got to watch these. And I laughed for five minutes. My abs hurt so bad (laughs) from laughing. (laughs) I didn't know it was like a thing. Oh yeah. It's like the start of fall is officially September 22nd. Okay. So we're early. We're talking about this early. (laughs) Yeah. So PSL season when Starbucks releases their pumpkin spice latte. I had no idea. Is the new start to fall. Okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. So tell us, like, do you do you face any challenges like in your industry with the technology and with digital versus people still wanting handwriting or just business challenges? Can you share with our listeners like what in, in your creative world, what are some challenges that you see like with the industry? Well, I'm going to be totally frank. Um, Should. <laughs> I know, right? So, but I, I want to preface, you know, what I'm about to say with that. So I believe you did a podcast a while ago about style shoots. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> and I had some major growing pains with styled shoots when I first started a lot of information that like wasn't out there that I wasn't really aware of. And it just kind of put this like, not a bad taste in my mouth, but left me very cautious. Um, so, and I want to share that with the listeners because I think that as someone new starting off in the industry, it's super important to be aware of like what's going on with the styled shoots. So I, Angela, I did 15 styled shoots in 2017. What? And I'd, I've already done 18 this year. Wow. And in 2017, when I first started, I was like saying yes to everything. You know, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Of course I'll do it. Of course I'll do it. Even if I have to like stay up all night, I'm going to figure it out. And well, Claire, we all do that. So don't. Right. <laughs> yeah. We, we have to so, the hard way. <laughs> But right. But so no one told me Mm -hmm. that like, I don't know that it was important to double check who the photographer was or some of the pictures bad. I mean, so some of them, it's not that they were bad. It's that the photographer on quite a few of the shoots did not have experience with details. Yeah, that's not And I've since learned that like detail shots, it's a thing. Like I would love for all photographers to step up their game, like calling out all photographers, Mm -hmm. but a photo of, you know, calligraphy, like of an envelope or an invitation suite that's out of focus is not usable. No. And so I would find myself doing all this work and not getting usable images out of it and then being scared to like get it re-photographed and, you know, worry that I would offend someone. And so that was so hard for me. And then also not knowing that, you know, here's the photos, but you can't release them until we pitch this to, you know, five different publications. Uh Uh-huh. And it could be like two years. Yeah. Like, I'm not even kidding. And I put in, like, hours of sweat and tears into it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, no one told me that this was a thing. Yeah, and and 
so a couple things on style shoots, like, well, my whole thing is like a planner and a designer is that a, they take a long time, B, nothing's free in life and C, half the stuff that people have asked me to do in the past is very unrealistic and it's beautiful for the photo shoot, but it's not realistic to recreate for an actual event. So that's my whole beef with it. But in your circumstance, I mean, I deal with that stuff all the time. And so a couple like little nugget things that has helped me learn the hard way is number one, if, um, and again, this is just something that like through experience, like what I would do that, like in your situation, you know, they may be like, oh, it's just, you know, some paper and some signs. But like you just said, it's your tools, your ink, your time, like that's valuable. The paper, like that shit costs money. And so it's like, what's your ROI? So I actually did a talk not too long ago. Um, somebody asked me to do a talk on ROI and being on TV and like how it brings you business. And so I'm like, no, actually it doesn't work like that at all. Like people, it's cool. And for a hot five minutes and then, you know, people move on. But as the you, as the, as the business owner have to educate the consumer on the opportunities that you have gotten. And so now with style shoots, like having a contract and having a shot list and having like, there's nothing wrong with it, but you've oh, got to yeah. put parameters around it and saying that you can use my images or you can use my paper, my calligraphy, my work, whatever. However, there, here's 10 things that I have to have because it's going to help me and you be successful. And so yeah. it's almost like, and I'm sure you, you can relate to this it, since you just taught a class, but I had to put my contract where I'm speaking and teaching that the venue, there cannot be another event going on next door to me or downstairs or upstairs to where, like I spoke one time and there was a band playing downstairs and it didn't matter if I was like dancing on the table nude, like I'm being funny, I would never do that, but <laughs> I was not going to keep their attention. And I'm talking about tech, okay, to creative people. So it's hard to keep their focus to begin with. And so I'm like, oh my God, I'll never, ever do that again. It was an awful experience on both sides. And so sometimes we just have to learn that the hard way. I mean, it sucks. No one tells us that. I mean, that's why I, I, one of the main reasons I do this podcast is like, let me tell you what happened and we're real. And now with a lot of the events we do, if I don't know the photographer, um, I will flat out ask them, like, I know that we hired or the client hired you, you know, to capture their wedding. However, the only thing I have at the end of the day is photo and video. And if you are not capable of providing a team member to capture these things and like, don't expect anything. You got to give direction and communicate. 90% of the time they'll look at me and say, oh, I don't have another person that can do this. So because I, I, I guess they're scared. I guess they're intimidated. I don't know. It's a time thing. And so if it were me, I would hire a third or fourth photographer to come in for an hour so I can put my logo on it and, you know, have credit to work with all these vendors. But it amazes me at how many people do not jump at that opportunity because it's actually in my contract now that we have the right to bring in our own people to capture an hour of photo video. And it's probably the best money I've ever budgeted from a marketing standpoint, just because I don't trust people anymore. I've done some beautiful things and the clients are amazing and they're so happy and I have nothing to show for it because they didn't capture the details. <laughs> they didn't right. get a full room shot. They didn't get, I mean, it's just heartbreaking when you worked on something, like you said, for hours and hours and hours and hours and there's nothing to show for it. So. Definitely. I mean, I obviously I could like go off on a tangent on that for a while. I know. I know. And yeah. as of 2018 this year, I mean, so that was my challenge in 2017 for sure. Like the growing pains of learning what goes on in style shoots in 2018. I've started because Angela also, you have to think I'm not at the shoot. I'm working. Oh yeah, definitely. I, yeah, totally. So I'm like texting the planner and I'm like, Hey, make sure, you know, X, Y, and Z is taken care of. But I've, you know, started sending a shot request list. There you go. And like, 
a little bit of a contract. It's helped out a lot. And then when I have gotten the photos back and all my shots aren't met, I have actually emailed the photographer a couple times on separate shoots and they have been so generous. They're like, mail me, you know, the paper, like whatever it is you need and I'll do it in my studio. And then they definitely end up over serving. Like, it's amazing. Well, the that's stuff great. That they- yeah. And I, and at first I was so scared. I'm like, I don't want anyone to be mad at me. And then now I'm like, no, no, you know, let's, this is my time. It's really so. all about, but honestly, it's all about good communication and mm-hmm. like, see, even you had the perception of like, oh my gosh, I don't want to hurt anyone too, or I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. And so I'm glad that you brought that up and you're like opening up the conversation. Like you're not going to hurt anybody. It's every once in a while. I do have people that, you know, photographers, they get kind of like huffy and puffy about it. Um, but I also know for mental health, don't take things personal because sometimes people are just having a really rough time and you never know what people are going through. So, you know, I'm, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt that they're doing the best they can. Um, but sometimes that just, um, translates to me like laziness (laughs) so bad, Yeah, but it just, it's like you got to you got to communicate you got to open the conversation up and see what each other's expectations are on both sides um yeah. so any new challenges for 2018 even i feel like the year is just where has it gone oh my gosh where has it gone we're heading into the fourth quarter i um i'm working on a bunch of holiday calligraphed products that's awesome yeah, it's scary. It's super scary, but I, you know, cause I'm a perfectionist and I'm like, nothing's perfect. And I want it to be perfect, but time is of the essence at this point. So I'm getting ready for the holidays and Christmas cards and, you know, winter and fall weddings. Can you get people to bring you their Christmas card envelopes early? Or do you find it that people wait to the last minute? Oh my goodness. People wait till the last minute. So and like I would, rush fee yeah. charge. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 And sometimes I had some last year that like, you know, they give them to me three days before Christmas and they're like, I don't even care if what? it gets out before Christmas. And I'm like, okay. So lesson learned from last year. I did not get out any of my personal holiday cards uh-huh. because I was so busy working on everyone else's. And, um, I will say this year I have already ordered my cards Look at and you. Okay. My own clips. cause I figure, you know, they go out to my clients and my vendors and the venues I love to work with and people I've collaborated with throughout the year. And what's like better advertising for a calligrapher than a piece of mail with calligraphy on it. Right. So I really, I jumped on it like August 1st. I'm like, let's do this. (laughs) That's very impressive. Like there's so many business owners that don't, they can't think that far ahead because they're so like down into working in the business instead of on it, like looking ahead. So yay, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you do any like products for holidays? Like does anybody have you do any like ornaments or like anything oh, yeah. special that we can tell our listeners about to like, Oh my goodness. Watch yes, you on Instagram. Yeah. Great question. Um, so I do ornaments. Everyone loves a good ornament, like a Mr. And Mrs. Established 2018. Um, I have, I'm going to have wrapping paper released here in the next few weeks with my hand lettering on it for the holidays. That is so cool. Yeah. (laughs) And it's really fun because it can also be used as like a table runner on a holiday table or envelope liners for your Christmas cards. Um, so I'm really pumped about that. And let's see what else I have some pie toppers for Thanksgiving. Ooh that say like thankful in my calligraphy and um the biggest thing that I want to share for your followers I'm so so excited about this so I get 
these ideas, right? Like anyone does and you just run with it. Yeah. And you hope that everything sticks. So I came up with this idea. I'm doing wreath attachments in like a birch, like think like a piece of laser cut wood in calligraphy. Oh, interesting. And uh, yeah, so I reached out to, you know, pulling back some, some names from styled shoots that I've done. I've reached out to about nine different florists Wow! and they're all on board. Um, and they are all creating, so they're all creating a different wreath, like a wreath for their style. And then I'm giving them the wreath attachment. And then my call to action to my followers and your listeners and everyone involved is to send me a photo of your front door. Okay. So I want to see like trendy doors, modern doors, you know, traditional, vintage, eclectic, whatever. Uh And I'm doing a wreath photo series. So you would be committing to letting me come out and take a photo of the wreath on your door. You would get to keep the wreath. And then I'm going to be featuring the florist and the photo one a week throughout the holiday season. That is such a cute idea. Yeah. So I'm really excited because I haven't officially, I mean, opened, you know, you're kind of the first person I've told about it besides the florists that are participating, but I'm like, you know, I hope people submit their photos or else I'll be hanging wreaths on my neighbor's doors. I don't know. (laughs) Well, you could like with us, um, like we're not in, some people are at work more than they are at home. And so like, if people can't do it like at home, like you, you know, you could go to work or you could just go around Nashville and find some really cool doors. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. And that's the thing. I don't, it doesn't, you don't have to tell me you don't live there. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so. What if, so where do they send the photos? Like, so there's a link okay. on my Instagram. Okay. In your bio. Says, in my bio. Okay. And it says, photo door contest or door photo contest or something like that. And, uh, you fill out a form with your name and your address and your email address, and you upload a photo of your door in the form. And then I will be sending. So the, the cool thing is that the florists are actually going to pick the door. So they're going to tailor their wreath to your door. That's so cool. Yeah. So, and then I'll have my little attachments on it. They'll, they'll say like Mary or cheers or thankful, or, you know, if anyone wants to order a custom one with their family name. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about it. That is so cool. Like, congratulations. That's such a fun idea. and like, so cool to launch. Like, so cool. What are your thoughts? Like, around Etsy and like that whole experience of people like getting paper and invitations and calligraphy off of that. Do you do that? I do Etsy. I don't, you do. Yeah. I don't do a lot of work on Etsy. Okay. Um, but I have it up there and you know, it's, I don't know. It's not something I put a ton of my attention to. Okay. And it's, is it more word of mouth for you or Instagram or is that mainly like the driver for you? Word of mouth. Um, you know, I have amazing relationships with planners throughout the city and referrals and social media. That's awesome. That's where all my, you know, and so many people, it's crazy. Like I had someone today reach out and they referred to a post that was over a year old. Oh, wow. That's and cool. Like, Can I? Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, you remember that? And then I'm just like, no, they probably just scrolled through, you know, but it's, it's the power of social media is just so amazing. It is. And it's just, some people are like, oh, it's overwhelming. But I will say like one thing, if you can pick one platform and be consistent, it works, right? I mean, you're like a poster child for it. Like it freaking works. Yeah. So it does. that's awesome. And people do care. Like 
whenever I'll never forget, like when Facebook live and Insta story and all that started coming out and the guy I was working with at the time, this branding manager, he's like, you got to do this and this. And I'm like, what? Like, I don't have time for that. And like, people don't care what I'm doing. <laughs> like, are you serious? Oh, but they totally care. Yeah, but like, they want to see the ins and outs and the yeah, grit behind everything. I didn't. Um, yeah, it's just, it's very interesting, but people I feel like do like when you can help or relate, then I feel like people want to do business with you because they trust you. And they're like, oh, look at all, you know, they can do this and they can do this, but then they can be out of work mode too. So yeah. It's yeah. Like, and it just makes it so personal. Yeah. Like to see that there's an actual person behind mm-hmm. the business and that that person is like a real life person that's probably just like you. Yeah. It, it attracts people. And with the Instagram stories and the Facebook live and all these things, Angela, I'll tell you the biggest like following and the likes and the saves and everything on social media that I get are from videos of me working. Yeah. It's not the pretty styled shoot videos yeah. or the pretty, you know, stage photos. It's like me with a top knot in my pajamas, mm-hmm. hand lettering on an envelope. Yeah. So do you time lapse? Like, do you put your phone up there and have a little tripod and time lapse yourself like writing <laughs> ever? I try. And I did one time successfully, but like, it just gets, I'm, I don't know, the tripod is a, is a mess. It's a mess. And then <laughs> I, I'll like set it because 90% of the work I do is literally at my coffee table yeah. in my living room yeah. while watching TV. And my dog is on my couch behind me and I've put the tripod like on my credenza on my TV stand facing me. Yeah. And I did a video and it looked like I, it was, it was crazy stupid. Cause I literally didn't move for hours. And the only thing you see moving is my dog Aww. to kind of see like the time. Cause I just sit there and I just hash it out. Yeah. But so, that's neat though. I mean, have you yeah. ever, um, like there's a painter that we work with Heidi and she, she'll time lapse like all of her, um, like painting. And it's almost like when she's far away, like you can't really tell. And then it's like, it, it looks like, oh, in 60 seconds, she like creates this little mini Does masterpiece. Paint your event. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love her. Yeah. Like, and so it's yeah. just, it's really neat. And like, you could, um, you like, she does that clock thing and it's like, yeah. okay, you show it to the camera and then it's like, bam, I did 620 envelopes in five hours. Um, <laughs> that would be nice right? if I could do but, that fast. But people do care about that. I was going to ask you, like, do you time yourself to see how long a specific font takes you? I Well, or does it work no, like that? <laughs> that would stress me out. I know that a modern font, like a jumpy calligrapher, like, you know, like modern calligraphy where it's, jumpy and most of it's in lowercase that takes me a lot less time than a traditional copper plate font gotcha um but usually when I have like an order of say 300 envelopes I can sit down and hash that out in a day so like a Saturday and then I'll take breaks walk my dog eat some food yeah but Yeah. And so that's kind of usually during the week, my weeks, I'm usually spending my time on the computer and working on signage for events. And then my weekends, I'm sitting down with the pen and ink. Well, so do you, um, do you, so if somebody brings you 300 envelopes for, you know, 300 households, do you tell them like, please order me 10% extra envelopes because ink spills or what, what would be your recommendation for like a percentage of envelopes? I'm just thinking of like, you already know. So I, I send them once they've confirmed the quote with me for the, like the actual project, I'll send them a document that has, you know, I need 10 to 15% extra envelopes. And that is for not just ink spills, but for um, nib snags, which is like the actual nib on the pen can snag on the paper, especially if you have like a toothy 
craft paper or something that has a lot of fibers in it. Um, so that can be tricky and I always ask for the extras for that. The other reason why I ask, I, um, I'm human and a lot of people forget that I'm not a printer just printing this out, but I, so I have a proofreader. I have an assistant who proofreads all my work. That's amazing. And it is actually the absolute best investment that I've ever made in my business, (laughs) but she she's so sweet. She's like the one who makes sure that all my I's are dotted and my T's are crossed and I'm not inverting zip codes. But, you know, I, if I'm knocking out a bunch of envelopes, I'm bound to misspell a few things here and there. So like the person who spells their name, William with one L, like, I'm not going to catch that on my first run. So in my mind, I think William, there's only one way to spell it. And I spell it out with two L's and then my proofreader will catch it. And so that's the other reason why I need the extra envelopes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people understand. The other thing I'll say that, that has been super helpful because I work with a lot of clients that are just very last minute, which is okay, but, um, it can put a little pressure on some, not just like one or two people, but like four or five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. So if, if a client is ordering their invitations kind of late, because I like to have the RSVPs 45 days in advance, especially if we have a seated dinner and if there's an entree choice, I want time to detail all that out. And so, and if it's a destination wedding, I want to make sure people have a room or an Airbnb. So we've been asking on RSVPs in addition to dietary restrictions, where the heck are you staying? (laughs) Because it's just so different. Like ever since Airbnb, like it's hard to like get buses and welcome itineraries and boxes and, you know, all this stuff out to people when we don't know where the heck they are and it just taints their experience. And so I don't know. I was like totally going off on a tangent, but I feel like if people are at the last minute, I try to get the company to send us the like overnight the envelopes quickly. So we're not waiting like four weeks on the envelope and the invitations, you know, unless it's like some in-house thing. So is that something that you try to tell your clients, like get your envelopes ahead of time and bring them to me and I can be working on them while your invites are in production? It just depends. I mean, if it's during, you know, a peak, pre-peak wedding season. So for me, like the spring wedding season and the fall wedding season are my peaks, but I'm doing the envelopes, you know, eight weeks, if not more before that. I schedule out my weekends. So I like if some if you contacted me today and you were like, I, I need 300 envelopes done before a certain date. I mean, I'm going to look at my calendar and see what, what's open. And if I can make it work, I can make it work. If not, you know, it really doesn't matter so much. I can I guess, I don't know. It, I find that like the last minute people generally already have their envelopes in hand. Does that make sense? Like they're like, Oh, I'm kind of last minute. And I, I know I want calligraphy, but I haven't found anyone. And, you know, I'm like, okay, well, let's do it. Or if they don't have their invitations and envelopes in hand, I tell them, go ahead and get your envelopes shipped directly to me. Um, Yeah. And another tip, a lot of people don't know this, but most calligraphers charge extra when your envelopes are lined before they get them. Did you know that? No. Yeah. So the reason why, and every calligrapher should be charging extra if they're not, but the reason why they do that is because it requires extra pressure on the hand oh. when it's, like, it's essentially like two pieces of, you know, cardstock or paper underneath the pen and it slows down the process. So I'll tell people like, if you can get your liners separate than your envelopes, like not already assembled, yeah, that's going to save you money and it'll save me time. I can get them done quicker. Right. That's a really good tip. No one's yeah. ever asked us that before. Like to, I mean, 
we can do, you know, do it that way. Um, I've just never had anybody ask that, but that is so good to know. That's awesome. Yeah. It's one of my questions that I ask up front, just like what kind of ink color do you want? You know, but are your envelopes lined and it's, you know, sometimes people don't care to pay the extra 25 cents an envelope or, you know, whatever the fee is. Yeah. But other times when they're, you know, this is something that means a lot to them to have done, but they're on a budget. Like that's a way to cut costs. Absolutely. And I love that you are like giving away like little tidbits of like, yes, you can cut cost by doing this, but you can still have customized calligraphy and beautiful paper and beautiful writing. But you know, you don't have to pull out all the stops to spend all your money on paper on this. So that's awesome because you're, yeah. you're there for the client, which is amazing. There so. for the client and always, you know, if it's something that can um, cause my hand a little less stress, I'm happy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Are there like exercises that you can do to like strengthen your hands? No, I, you know, I have a lot of, um, I call them my calligraphy friends. It's so nerdy, but I do, I have a lot of calligraphy calligrapher friends and they talk about different like hand massagers that they've found online or, you know, stuff that they do. And I'm just like, I don't have time for that. I do yoga and, you know, stretch it out, but that's awesome. Well, yeah. Well, where can all of our listeners find more about you? I know that you mentioned Instagram. What uh, what's your handle and all that good stuff so they can go and see more? Yeah, so my Instagram handle is at white ink calligraphy. And in my profile or my bio on Instagram, I also have my personal Instagram on there. So if you want to follow my personal life and my travels, it's on there as well. Um, my website is whiteinkcalligraphy.com and my email is claire at whiteinkcalligraphy.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for being on today. And Thanks for having me. I'm so happy this happened, Angela. Yay, finally. <laughs> and everyone for tuning in, thank you so much. Be sure that you go and check Claire's work out and enter that contest for what's the deadline? Just so people know. Um, the so the deadline's gonna be be that's a good question i'm thinking early october gotcha okay <laughs> well you'll have to follow her on instagram so thank you so much everybody for tuning in and have a great day bye if you found this podcast helpful please share it with your friends and i'm so very grateful if you will leave a review be sure you are a subscriber so you never ever miss the juicy details of weddings unveiled also, be sure that you're a part of my email list, and if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.